has begun. Welcome everybody to another OSPO working group. Uh, this is the Chaos OSPO working group. If you meant to be in another Zoom, now is the chance. Um, I am Gary White, uh, hosting this instance of this meeting. And we can jump right in by talking to Anna about the OSPO book in collaboration with To Do that's been going on for a little while. Uh, Anna, you only have until I think uh, 30 or about 20 minutes now. So please go ahead. Okay, yeah, thank you. So um, I know like in the past we had some uh, topics around the, the OSPO book. And so now we are meeting, the, the contributors are meeting every two months. Um, and we have like people in charge of reviewing the content or the people in charge of creating the content. But there was one specific chapter uh, that I, we briefly discussed in this group that was about measuring and um, like measuring the impact of the OSPO and all around metrics. So it, it made more sense to, instead of duplicating work, um, try to see what this working group has been doing and reference, maybe having as a introduction in the book and then said, okay, and if uh, this group is creating guides, I, I heard that from uh, mm -hmm. Don Foster, you were aiming to create some kind of guides. So reference those guides there. So people that go to the book, they can later say, oh, so I didn't know about chaos. Just an example. And I didn't know they already have guides on this metric. So what is the best way to do this? Um, who can be, I'm sorry about my writing. I was like writing super fast and there are so many typos and this is being recorded. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, but um, <laughs> who be or, Go over like, here. Who would like to help or to be this kind of um, liaison or uh, or a chair that is able to to connect? Like, okay, this is what we have been doing in chaos, and I feel like having this kind of introduction as part of the book and and make like the necessary connections in a way that is helping also the chaos community to outstem in that project. Um, mm -hmm. That's that's what I would like to hear from you if. If you feel like this idea makes sense, or and and any other ideas that you would like to to see this connection uh, happening. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think it's a good opportunity to bring up to folks, not just in this working group, but also I'd like to bring this up in the Chaos Weekly call to make sure that we get somebody who has their hands in a lot of the working groups to be a decent liaison for chaos in general. As far as uh, what's been happening in the OSPO working group, uh, we do have that Google Doc of all of the previous topics and specifically the insight guides. Uh, we do, I know that uh, Don has been leading the charge on that and has one of the more mature ones of, uh, I believe it's, which one is she working on? Is it responsiveness? Does anybody remember exactly which one it is? Yes, it is. Yeah. So we have a few that are more mature than others, um, responsiveness being one of the one of the furthest along. So we're happy to reference those, but I I would like to bring this back up in the weekly call where we have folks from a lot of working groups to give a good answer for what is chaos doing right now, uh, not just what this working group is doing right now. I, I also think, think that, yeah, go ahead, Sean. Um, Matt, I think you've been really plugging away at at our chapter for a bit, and you've asked us for some help in the past. Um, yeah, could so please, what, somebody else, please contribute. <laughs> so yeah, what Sean is showing here is just that. You know, a long time ago, we feels like a long time ago, we started putting this book chapter together, um, and we have. <laughs> yes, August, July, uh, April twenty fourth is when we started. Okay, so a year ago. Um, and so what this is, is we had kind of taken some time, if you scroll down a little bit, Sean. Yeah, of course. Came up with just a, that circle, just a couple of functions of the organizational OSPO, and then how you might think about each one of those functions in terms of challenges, how you overcome those challenges, and then questions and metrics or models to consider. So this could be to the insight guides as well. And so everything that's in here, so the challenges, how you overcome those challenges in the OSPO was 
through a conversation here in this working group. So I had just kind of presented these questions and y'all had given answers and I had taken a lot of notes and tried to, to summarize those notes. So right now we have three of the four at least framed out, kind of what you see there around A, B, and C, kind of at the bottom of the page. We have the same for community engagement, A, B, and C, education, A, B, and C. We haven't done anything around strategy yet. Uh, so this is how we've approached it so far. I think we, there was some hesitation in that we didn't really know what the other book chapters were writing about. So it was hard for us to know like kind of what we should be saying or what might be covered in other book chapters, but maybe that's a little bit clearer mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so um, I can maybe set light into uh, what we are working in for this year roadmap. And um, so it's a work in progress. I've, I think I've shared the chapter four. If you go mm -hmm. in the notes uh, to chapter four, yeah, that one. So this is something that we are uh, trying to put together also in the working groups. That is like the pain points that people working in the OSPO are racing and there are a lot and we are i mean there are some of those challenges that you have been adding and, and framing really well in the in the documentation but there are so many and we are trying to put somehow on not just that the challenges but also like trying to build this okay what are the fundamental results for the OSPO to focus on this what is the perceived value by the organization and then uh Maybe if there are some differences on what is the perfect perceived value when using open source or when is the perceived value when contributing to open source. So we are trying to, maybe it's a, a little bit more complex, but I'm I feel like uh taking uh the index from this chapter and uh having the challenges that are written here and maybe add yours and we can maybe there are some challenges that you add in this guide that can be also addressed in this book. And so we can like align it better. And from that, uh, maybe it's easier for you to work and hopefully it doesn't complicate things. So are you su suggesting that we work kind of in in chapter four right here, what you have and try so, to work, merge what yeah, we Yeah, so it's about, so I my understanding is that you are looking into okay in the day-to-day -day operation of the OSPO that can be a wide um, field uh, what are the challenges and that is something that in in chapter four they are being raised so um, my suggestion is to have chapter four as a, some kind of index so or, or like a reference so you can just say, oh, okay, we didn't thought on this challenge. Is it something from that challenge that we can take and convert into a question and, and, and solve through a metric? Okay. Because I feel like there might be more challenges here in this chapter than maybe you have thought. Um, I'm, I'm... Yeah, I mean, likely. So. So Sean, if you go, or go ahead, Sean. Oh, I, was, I think what this would be useful for us is that you, you said an index. I'm thinking more like a checklist. Like we can go back through the narrative as, as it exists and the outline as it exists and see if there are components that we might also include that are here. Is that what you're suggesting, Anna? <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you feel something uh, from this uh, content that is still, it's, uh, as I said, it's still in work in progress. I know some people here, I saw Alice, Alice also is working um, in part of the OSPO book and she, she can tell as well that we are trying to align better and to, we're having a meeting uh, on April, 1st of April, to try to keep working on, on this and be more cohesive. But um, if you feel like there are like big, uh, sections that you think that oh we haven't thought of that you can take that section and start working uh in in the chapter of the metrics side and and start working from there that is my suggestion but i don't know if it makes mm. sense uh for the rest of people here i think it makes sense so 
so this what is this chapter called what is chapter four called what's the title of this yeah it's uh defining day-to-day -day operations it's okay. yeah it's still a deep dive into day-to-day -day operations okay. yeah. so you're thinking that what we've talked about in that other document could become part of this chapter is that right um or so the, when when you're talking about the challenges, yes, when you're starting to define from those challenges, questions, and metrics, that yeah. would be part of the chapter five. That would be part of chapter. Okay. Five. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Wow. So that would link those two chapters together then more clearly. That makes and sense. And I th I think we may find that, you know, I can't. I have to go through in some detail, but it, we may find there's more content prescribed here on this than we can put together, or that that uh, we might want, that uh, book, book people might want in a single chapter. So I could easily see, once we look at the document that Matt, mostly you've developed thus far, and um, then, um, I don't know how I lost that room, I guess, wherever that document went. Uh, and then this, sorry, that might be bigger. Like if we put it all together, it might end up bigger than a chapter. I think that's, it would be two chapters. So one is chapter yeah. four, which Anna was showing, or you were showing, mm -hmm. Anna was talking about the deep dive mm -hmm. that we would potentially add challenges that we have identified and also recognize challenges that are in here as well. And then chapter five would be a chapter on measurement towards those challenges. Okay. That's I did not pick that up previously from the conversation, so sorry about that. That's how I understand it. Hmm. And okay. and also, so um, I, maybe you didn't notice because, as I said, this is work in progress. But it is like every chapter has a resource section at the end. Mm -hmm. and ideally, I would like like if you are developing oh, the document, the document you shared previously, and you created as a chaos uh, guide, mm -hmm. like reference that chaos guide, uh, and so people can actually see the. The the, uh, the the initial work or like sure. the the origin of of the work um so that's that that's where it will be there okay and um, about recommendations this is was more like okay because there are ospers that are so different sometimes there are specific people that say this happened a specific thing happened to me we don't say the organization and this is like how we solve it so that's the recommendations about section about. It's more mm -hmm. like just um like a question answer uh thing. Chan, I see you also have your hand up. Yeah, for that section, I think um the Intersource Commons uh foundation has a really good way in which they set this up and they put it as known instances opposed um and so for them, yes, they um, call out the company for that, but and we don't have to do that here, but I like the way they format it in that they're like, here's the problem, here's how, here's, um, or here's the situation, um, here's what we did, and then here was the outcome. Um, and I can send that over to you. I, I think that would fit really nicely here. You, you mean about the, the patterns, the inner source patterns? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. but it, specifically yeah. that part of like known instances. Because hmm. it is that what you're trying to get here? Is like we know this I, happened somewhere. By, by known it... by known instances, how what did you mean? Sorry. Um. So in a pattern, um, they will say, um, we know there is an issue with um. Or, or say, okay, maybe one of the patterns is um, having a marketplace for people to find your open source project. Um, then mm -hmm. at the bottom of that pattern, it'll say, here are the known instances we know in the industry that have marketplaces. And it'll say, um, this company or this company, and then the situation that they 
might have gone through of getting that marketplace and then how they were able to get there. Hmm. Um, yeah. So, so, I, mm -hmm. it, I don't know if that's different from what you're trying to describe in the recommendation section here. Uh, so I, I, I feel like, so we are also doing like use cases. So for mm -hmm. instance, um, Sony or Ports, they release their open source and NOS journey and they're, and it's more like the, what you're, um, what you're explaining feels that is more like as a use case where they, there is a problem and they said, okay, and this is how we solve it. And here are all the materials and that is on the, let me share with you, there are a, a chapter is called end user and we are aiming to have more. Uh, and that, but the recommendation of scenarios is more like an anonymous thing. Because yeah, I and I'm not saying I'm not saying this has to be um, called out. I'm just saying I think the format of how they describe it is really well. They do it really well, and mm -hmm. I, I I just wonder if if that fits into this space. Um, just a, a recommendation that doesn't have to be taken. So, um, but I can send that over. Yeah, and but, but I still I still think that uh, somehow in the use case I I've just share the link so you can take a look and maybe like the approach of the use cases is similar it's more similar to the approach of the inner source patterns but maybe I'm wrong and I'm just understand I understand a different thing but I just share with you uh, so you can take a look at that. <clears throat> Did you share yeah, the link in the document? I don't. Yeah, see yeah, yeah. It. Okay. It's open it? uh, right below chapter five. Yeah, that, yeah, that one. Yep. So you can briefly go like ports or Sony, and if you download it, you can take a look that it says more like this is a problem. This is why it was needed. Um, what it's doing, and then some situations and so on. Yeah. This is an example that Chan mm -hmm. shared in chat. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, back here, this is your link. Yeah, but you just click on one of the uh, end users. If not, you're not going to see the pattern. Oh, wow. Mm. Oh, wow. So the recommendations um, that you're searching for are simpler than this, or you want them to be very comprehensive? No. So the the recommendation section is just like um, is less less. Uh, this is more the use cases. The okay. recommendation is more like this is a situation that is happening and that we've seen that all the OSPOs are facing, mm -hmm. and it's some best practices that has helped all the OSPOs to doing it. And these are more like a global view of a specific organization trying right. to achieve a, a problem um but okay. maybe, maybe uh, without with different angles and so on all right and i have one question for anna anna who is authoring chapter four at the moment who's leading uh, yeah so um we have a set of chairs. So uh, there is um, uh, chair and co-chairs that are reviewing the content or there are creating the content and, and well, and infrastructure team. So um, Alice is, is one of the reviewers, okay. uh, also helping on content. I'm co-chairing uh, creation. Also, um, Greg Lee from Nokia, Ospat Nokia, is helping on the creation. Um, and who else was a uh, Chris Ye for China Mobile Ospo is also uh, helping. Um, I need to I I need to check. It's on the it's on the notes from the meeting notes, but okay. uh, we are also we are having a meeting like on Monday also to to better align, and uh, we can add any of the people here as like. This is the person that is going to be aligning what has been done in chaos and has been is going to be bringing content also to the OSPO uh, book in chapter four and chapter five. Yeah, I can be that person. I probably need to start talking to some folks who have put the content into chapter four, because if I'm mm -hmm. going to 
use it or make suggestions, it might be nice to meet the people. Okay, so it will be saying it I, will, sorry, it will be great if you can join the next uh, contributors call that is gonna be the first Monday of April. Uh, we have uh, one like more a Asia Pacific uh, time zone, but the other one is more uh, like uh, for um, America friendly time zone. Okay. So maybe you can join that one. Can you either add me? To I will the send the link. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because yes, I think I should join that. That would help me a lot. So I'm not just kind of guessing how the alignment should look and then issuing PRs against your docs in hopes that they emerge. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Add awesome. you, add you to the whole series. So, just yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks. Thanks, Anna. I've brought yeah. it back to the agenda. I think that's where Gary would want me. Thanks a lot. Uh, I just wanted to close that up and make sure nobody had any questions or follow ups for Anna, and or that Anna was all set and got what she needed from this meeting on this topic. <clears throat> Going once, I've, I've going nominated through. myself as the liaison. So unless yeah. anybody else wants the job, you'll be liaising. <laughs> no, we'll be we'll be letting you liaise, Matt. You, yeah, I think I said. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. All righty, let's uh, keep the train rolling, and do the Chaos Cast Ospo Spotlight. So uh, Don has shared in the Slack channel that. She'd like to do OSPO Spotlight Series for the podcast. There are some examples in the meeting notes um, if you're interested and you want to know a little bit more. Uh, but the idea is one to three people from OSPO to talk about metrics and data. Uh, and I don't know if anybody here can speak any more to that, but just if anybody has questions about that here or you just want to reach out to Don, then please do so. It looked like in the Slack, channel there had been a number of people who had expressed interest in helping mm -hmm. so yeah we got a few yep and just i guess psa if you're interested please reach out to dawn uh she's not here because she's in kubernetes France. land but that'll be somewhere. paris i think right mm -hmm. that is also what i think what a life all right. Um, repository cohort updates to Augur. This is from Isaac, I think. Oh, yeah, Isaac, you want to talk about that? Yeah, sure. This is just the recent you updates to Augur regarding uh, uh, categorization and the Nadia labeling. So Nadia Eggball has a set of categories that projects go into, and you, you all have adapted that slightly, right? Yes, uh, we're, we're uh, going off of the uh, project categorization uh, categories that Nadia Eggball uh, defined in the uh, Roads and Bridges book. Um, and uh, we uh, are using the um, exact values from Microsoft's implementation of it, and we uh, um, pushed it to Augur as an endpoint. Yeah, so that's pretty exciting. It's, it's an endpoint in Augur, and I believe your team's going to be developing an implementation that lets folks on the projects that you oversee see those Nadia positionings? Yes, yeah, uh, we're adapting it to be part of our uh, metrics site for our, uh, our open source program. Um, yeah. and did you um, say there's a fifth category you're adding on the advice of Microsoft? Yes, because of the Microsoft's uh, um, specific implementation for all of the cutoffs, um, there needs to be an additional category that's basically like medium or miscellaneous. Um, and so uh, on our end, uh, we will have to create a, a new badge that's basically the same as the ones that we see here, except uh, it'll say a, a medium or, or a medium sized repository or something like that. Um, and uh, why? Why are you do why why are you doing this? Like what's the motivation for this? Um mostly just like as a glance um 
like it, it's a metric that sort of like tells you about the the broader nature of the project mm -hmm. and sort of like um the nature of the metrics or, or the nature of the maintenance needed to 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 keep it running basically um like we have a similar notion in our government ospo of like tiers of so like tiered projects like we have a tier zero project that's like oh you release it out into the wild and you never touch it you know um, and this is sort of similar to that in uh, a more, this is sort of a more broad version of that. Like our, our tier list is very specialized to our work in government open source, um, whereas this is more broad. Okay. And are these projects that an organization is interacting with, or is it projects that that organization is responsible for, or both? Um, I would say both. Uh, it's it's definitely useful to know the nature of uh, your your various open source dependencies as well as the ones that you're responsible for maintaining. Just sort of like uh, it's good to know if there are are very few uh, contributors and a very high amount of users to a project, for instance, because that can be kind of a warning flag, you know. Okay. Um, would there be? Is there going to be like a, I'm sorry, I have so many questions. This is just interesting. So that's yeah. what I'm asking the questions. <laughs> um, so like based on these categorizations, is there an anticipated like next step that you would do? So like to your point of high contributor growth and high user growth, like that may be a project that <laughs> is experienced a, a lot of growing pains of a lot of different, from a lot of different directions. And so knowing that, like, what what do you do with the knowledge of that, other than knowing that, like, Rust is one of those projects? How does that make you respond to something like Rust? Like, like, like Rust, you said? Well, you have Rust on that list. Oh, yes. Uh, well... It, it, it's sort of just like it, it's not only risk but it also indicates like the mature maturity and like the nature of the, the project here i, I can uh, uh, it sounds like uh, remy wants to chime in okay. i do but i didn't want to cut you off oh, okay i would just you, know, you, you can go ahead first yeah so <clears throat> like isaac was just about to start saying we have our maturity model which is like mm -hmm. The different tiers that projects go through so in our very specific government context when we look at the repository maturity so if you're trying to go from a tier one project which is like a, a one-time release to mm -hmm. a project that wants to be working in the open and doing regular releases and accepting contributions we can say like okay you're a a tier one toy project and we want to get you to like a tier one or tier three toy project and then get you to a tier three club right where the proportion of contributors is higher or more in proportion to the number of users that you have mm -hmm. um, also just helping people inside of the agency and the community understand like where their project stands in relationship to other projects can be helpful too um, setting the expectation that, you know, a lot of people, when they think of open source, they think of like, oh, so like massive framework with millions of users and thousands of contributors. And uh, that is the, the most popular conception of what a successful open source project is. There are millions of examples of toys or clubs that are, you know, do one thing, do it well, have two or three maintainers, a solo maintainer and stable releases, right? So just yeah. helping people understand where their project compares to other projects, as well as how to move through the maturity model, um, if that's a goal. And if it's not a goal, that's okay too. Just making it clear to users or potential contributors where that project stands so that they don't expect that they're going to depend on it for you know, ongoing maintenance, or if you did want to get into ongoing maintenance, here are some of the steps you can do to get from a tier one to a tier three, that sort of thing. Uh, and we're still, of course, working on it. Uh, this is work in progress, but this lens to look at the projects through can be helpful, especially on the, on the outbound, but also on the inbound too, when we can do our own reviews and say, 
hey, it looks like you're going to inbound this dependency. Did you know that it has a lot? Doesn't have very many contributors. That's a community health check that you know we can use as an objective uh, measure. And it's nice too because it's in the Augur API. It's not something we implemented in our own metric site. It's something we figured would be useful to everybody and is part of the literature of the body of work here in open source. And so, you know, implementing something from uh, Nadia's book seemed like uh, a good way to give back. Thank you. Yeah, there's a lot of misunderstanding of open source, particularly from non developers and particularly from people in the government that are not developers. Um, and a lot of people either like have some misconceptions that it's just like some magic tool that you can use to get free labor or, <laughs> you know, and, and th this kind of like helps to deepen their understanding, um, and, uh, if, if, from a metrics perspective to, to, to give that understanding more, more readily. Makes sense. Thank you. I see. A... Yeah. I, I wanted to poke at the, um, the inbound that you had hinted at there, uh, Remy, of the inbound and outbound difference of, it sounds like for the most part, we're looking at this as a maturity model for inbound code. And I'm always, uh, you know, I have my own bias that we have this viability thing. And I'm interested in the thoughts of like a maturity model for code that you're consuming versus code that you're putting out into the wild. Because I think outbound code and having a maturity model makes uh, a lot more sense to give context than it does inbound because I think inbound, uh, there's a lot more to consider about how the code gets used than just about like a, a maturity framework. Do you have more that you're using um, in a maturity framework here or do you usually use this for inbound code or is it supplemental to something else? Yeah, so great questions. Um... In the OSPO, we are sort of the new kids on the block, right? So we aren't the folks who have been primarily concerned with inbound ingestion. And there are a rainbow of government policies that you mm -hmm. need to adhere to when you take on uh, inbound code. So there's you know federal executive orders around cybersecurity, around attestation for things like S-bombs that recently happened. Um, there's whole cybersecurity legislation, etc. So there's a lot more stuff on the books that already exists for inbounding. In the OSPO, uh, we are, you know, one of the approaches that we take is that we wouldn't want to ask someone else to meet a bar that we weren't going to meet ourselves. So part of establishing an outbound policy first is to say, this is the standard of open source that yeah, when we're releasing. And then how can we take that and convert that to an inbound checklist that can match as close as possible? But um, I think that there's also one of the biggest reasons why we want to have lots of lenses like project labeling is that depending on your project and depending on your threat model and depending on your dependency surface, like there are a variety of strategies of how acceptable risk is or isn't, or, you know, how specific you have to be about what dependencies or not like there are many different shades of gray that you want to take into consideration and the more metrics we have and the more lenses we have the better we can actually guide people towards that so we can say like hey this is a thing that goes on a website that goes into everybody's browser on the front end you know inbounding that is a little bit of a different threat model, then this is something that we're putting inside the data center inside of our mainframe on a daily basis, right? So, you know, the answer, of course, I could have just given you the TLDR and said, it depends and we're working on it, but, um, you know- no, I, I, pre I appreciate the comprehensive. That's kind of what I was digging at, so thank you. Right on. Yeah, but we we want to use best practices where we can. So if there are, examples of inbound checklists or inbound policies that other folks have in their OSPOs, you know, we would, we would love to take a look. Um, we just converted or are working on converting some of our outbound checklists to the different tiers and mapping them now. I um, mm -hmm. don't want to steal anybody's shine here on the call. I'll let Natalia talk about that later, but um, there's some stuff that's uh, under construction. And then once that's more complete, uh, we'll be hopefully, you know, converting to inbound checklists after that. Very cool.
All right. Uh, that answers my questions. Anything else for uh, Romy and Isaac while we're talking about Augur stuff? Going yeah. once. I don't think so. Going twice. Okay, it's gone. Uh, it seems like we're up to the reminders. Um, all things open, CFP uh, is open until the 22nd, which is tomorrow. So if you wanted to put something in for all things open, you got to write it up today or write it up tomorrow and submit it. And uh, ChaosCon NA 2024 registration is open. It is co-located with OSSNA. There's a visualizing metrics with software uh, morning event that I think I signed up for. So if you go, you'll probably at least see me uh, and a lot of other chaos folks that'll be there. And uh, OSSEU has opened their CFP. If you have other things that you don't want to submit to all things open or that you're in uh, the EU, EU adjacent and you'll want to uh, be there instead of in North America. All right. That I think unless other folks have agenda items, which I'll give a second, if anybody has anything they want to bring up as part of these conversations or just offshoots you'd like to talk about for a little bit. Okay, don't think so. Then we can cut uh, seven minutes early. Thank you so much, everybody, for attending another installation of our uh, OSPA, Chaos OSPA Working Group. And we'll see you again in another couple of weeks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.